The next item of business is debate on motion 21073 in the name of Christina McKelvey on celebrating International Women's Day 2020. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Christina McKelvey to speak to and move the motion for up to 12 minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, this coming Sunday is International Women's Day, a day to celebrate women's achievements and progress towards gender equality. This year's theme is Each for Equal, which recognises that we each have our part to play in making gender equality a reality. Because while significant gains for women's rights have been fought and won, gender equality remains an unwon case. 2020 is a significant year for the women's movement, 25 years since the fourth UN World Conference on Women. In September 1995, when I was just a wee, tiny wee woman at the time, still a wee woman probably, while the world looking towards the beginning of a new century, thousands of government representatives and activists gathered in Beijing to talk about women's rights. The conference is often remembered for a speech by Hillary Clinton, the then First Lady of the United States of America, in which she famously declared, women's rights are human rights. The outcome of the conference was the Beijing Declaration, a progressive blueprint for advancing women's rights, negotiated at times subject to heated debate, but ultimately agreed by 189 governments. A remarkable feat when you think that women's rights would have varied considerably, in some cases, between different countries. I'd like to read a short section from the Declaration itself, and it begins. We, the governments participating in the Fourth World Conference on Women, gathered here in Beijing in September 1995, the year of the 50th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations, determined to advance the goals of equality, development and peace for all women everywhere in the interests of all humanity acknowledging the voices of all women everywhere and taking note of the diversity of women and their roles and circumstances, honouring the women who have paved the way and inspired by the hope that the present of, of, in, in the world's youth. Recognise that the status of women has advanced in some important respects in the past decade, but that progress has been uneven. Inequalities between women and men have persisted and major obstacles remain with serious consequences for the well-being of all people. Also recognise that this situation is exacerbated by the increase in poverty that is affecting the lives of the majority of the world's people, in particular women and children, with origins in both the national and international domains. Dedicate ourselves unreservedly to addressing these constraints and obstacles and thus enhancing further the advancement and empowerment of women all over the world and agree that this requirement requires urgent, urgent action in the spirit of determination, hope, cooperation, and solidarity now and to carry us forward into the next century. Presiding officer, those words united countries towards a common cause and much has changed for the better as we know, but sadly women and girls around the world still experience hardship, poverty, violence and inequality. We must continue to change that. The platform for action which underpins the Bishan Declaration helps us. It sets out 12 critical areas of concern, aligning closely with the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, including poverty, health, education, armed conflict, the economy, human rights, media, the environment, power and decision making, violence against women and the girl child. Each area is broken down into strategic ob ob objectives and actions. If the Declaration provided us with a vision, presiding officer, the platform of action is the guide to realise it. I would like to provide members with an update now on what the Scottish Government is doing to progress in some of these areas. The Forensic Medical Services Victim of Sexual Offences Scotland Bill was introduced to this Parliament last November. It will cl clarify the legal basis for health boards to deliver forensic medical services, ensuring consistent access to services for people, whether or not they choose to report to the police. This is known as a self-referral. We want to give people control over what happens to them in these circumstances at a time when the ultimate control has been taken away. I was pl pleased also to confirm last week that funding for violence against women and services including rape crisis and women's aid centres will be increased to £13 million per year from this year in the 2021 budget. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Rape Crisis Edinburgh and all of the rape crisis uh, um, services, but especially Rape Crisis Edinburgh for the warm welcome they gave me last week in order to launch that very welcome 
uh, piece of uh, information about funding, their kindness and compassion. This money also helps to support projects which target prevention and early intervention, core to our violence against women strategy. That's called Equally Safe. We are strengthening the law. The Domestic Abuse Scotland Act commenced in April 2019 and reflects the full spectrum of domestic abuse, covering not just physical but other forms of psychological abuse and coercive and controlling behaviour. And we've some, seen some recent fig figures on the success of that piece of legislation. We have also introduced the Female Genital Mutilation Protection and Guidance Bill, which will create a new type of protection order for women and girls at risk. And in health, we are taking action on women's health through our commitment to develop a women's health plan. It will tackle women's health inequalities, raise awareness of women's health conditions and improve access to appropriate services and care. The plan will target access to postnatal contraception, abortion and contraception services, menopause services, something that I have a particular interest in, and outcomes in relation to endometriosis and heart disease. On period dignity, Presiding Officer Scotland is leading the world and we're very proud of this place for it. Since 2017, we have invested around £15 million to make free period products available in education settings and community settings across the country. I do welcome Monica Lennon bringing forward her period products free provision Scotland bill and congratulate her for getting that support required to pass stage one. But we do not need to wait for pieces of legislation, welcome as they are, to build on the good work we are already taking forward. That is why we are taking further action that includes bringing forward regulations to place a duty on local authorities to provide products and schools from the next academic year and exploring how we can support women with medical issues such as endometriosis to access the products that they need. In relation to women at work, there is another important anniversary this year, presiding officer, 50 years since the Equal Pay Act 1970 was passed. That was a milestone for women's rights in the 20th century, making it unlawful for women to be paid less than a man for doing the same work or work of equal value. In March 2019, the Scottish Government published a Gender Pay Gap Action Plan, A Fairer Scotland for Women. We will publish a report on progress later this spring. The drivers, as we know, of gender, gender pay gap are complex and equal pay is just one part of the jigsaw. The gender pay gap exists in part because men and women aren't actually doing the same jobs at all. Segregation still exists. Women are still concentrated in lower paid sectors and still assume the majority of caring responsibilities in household. This is why our transformational, um, of, our transformational of child care provision is so vital, as is promoting family friendly workplaces. We must also keep challenging gender stereotypes, including in early years and education settings, about the kinds of jobs that men and women do, but also in terms of who cares for children and family members. This was at the heart of one of the recommendations of the First Minister's National Advisory Council on Women and Girls, which, recommends, which recommended the introduction of two daddy months, additional paternity leave for dads. The Minister for Business, Fair Work and Skills wrote to the UK Government in January, urging the Government to improve the package of support offered to all parents and suggesting an additional 12 weeks paid leave for fathers on a non-transferable use it or lose it basis. He also recommended an increase in maternity pay for all women workers over a 52 week period and a review of eligibility for maternity allowance. Increasing the level and length of statutory provision to parents will promote the uptake of shared parental leave by fathers, support a more gender balanced approach to parenting while offering financial support to mothers and fathers at the birth of their child, crucial to a collective ambition of ered eradicating poverty. Yes, yeah, certainly. Rachel Hamilton. Uh, Christina McElvey to take the intervention. Um, that's very welcome, um, the shared parental leave. Would you say that actually the uptake has been quite low and that perhaps there needs to be um, more of an awareness campaign around that, that how it can promote both um, mothers and fathers? Christina McKelvey. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with uh, Rachel Hamilton on that. And uh, but just by putting it in the speech today and raising awareness in here, and hopefully lots of people will talk about it, we will do a bit of that ourselves today. But we should use all of our networks to make sure that people are taking up the opportunities that, that come from that, that additional um, work. And hopefully, you know, members across the chamber would support Jamie Hepburn and his quest for the UK government to change the rules around some of this as well. Um, 
presiding officer, the First Minister's National Advisory Council on Women and Girls was established in 2017 by the First Minister to be a critical friend, to champion the importance of gender equality and to be the challenging voice we are needed on, my goodness, have they challenged us in a brilliant way. The Council has just published its second report on the topic of policy coherence. It's the first uh, end of year report published in January last year. The Council made 11 recommendations on the topic of attitudes and culture change in areas from justice to education, childcare, political representation, women in the media, as well as paternity leave. Seven of the Council's 11 recommendations are in this current Scottish Government's programme for government. That tells you how influential they have been. They include the Forensic Medical uh, Services Bill I mentioned earlier and the creation of a new Commission on Gender Equality in Education. I am very pleased to be a member of the latter, which is co-chaired by the Deputy First Minister, John Swinney, and the amazing I Will Ambassador, Rosanna Hussein, and which met for the first time just last week. The Advisory Council also recommended, and the Scottish Government accepted, that the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women should be incorporated into Scots law. The National Task Force on Human Rights Leadership is considering options on how best to bring the protections and rights under the Convention and other treaties into our domestic law in Scotland. The Advisory Council also recommended the introduction of quotas to improve women's representation in politics, while acknowledging that the power to do so rests with the UK Government. Mm -hmm. Women's representation within the Scottish Parliament in this place has gone backwards since 1999, and women still make up just 30% of Scottish councillors. The even greater underrepresentation of disabled women and minority ethnic women is not tenable. But we have, a, we have a chance in the next few months, whilst we're all selecting our candidates for next year's elections, to remedy some of that. And it's imperative that this place has diverse women's voices and they're heard and represented in our democratic institutions. As I said, all political parties must accept our, accept our responsibility and I will certainly be taking that up within my party too. Presiding officer, I am incredibly proud of the work that is happening across all areas of government to help realise gender equality in Scotland. And I know much of that work is supported across party in this place, but I'm also clear we're on a journey. We have not won the war. We have challenged and battled a few battles on the way, but we still have a ways to go. But it's absolutely right to celebrate all the steps forward that have been made. Women fought for every one of those steps, whether the right to vote or the right for equal pay. And we must keep reminding ourselves about why equality is important and bringing it back to that core message from the Beijing Declaration. Women's equality is good for all of humanity. I move the motion in my name. I now call on Rachel Hamilton for up to seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Um, I'm delighted to open on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives and to support the Scottish Government's motion put forward by Christina McKelvey today. In the year of 2020, we need to have a 2020 vision uh, when it comes to promoting equality and opportunities for women. International Women's Day is a fantastic opportunity, as always, to celebrate how much things have changed for the better, from the Equality Act to votes for women to tackling the gender pay gap. And nevertheless, in 2020, there is still much to do and still a long way to go. The each for equal message of this year's International Women's Day is very fitting, given this year marks the 50th anniversary of the Equal Pay Act 1970 and the 10th anniversary of the Equality Act 2010. And I re recently finished a, a wonderful book by Jenny Murray, which you may be familiar with, entitled A History of the World in 21 Women. And Murray highlights the work of Benazir Bhutto and how it, in adversity she triumphed as a successful politician and prime minister. And it explores how women such as Malala Yousafzai uh, were inspired by Benazir's courage and determination. And we in this chamber need to be inspiring the next generation of women to stand for office and know that they can too achieve great things. However, we are all too aware that discrimination, hatred and prejudice still exists in today's society. Often we speak about the discrimination and stereotyping of women. It can be from an urban or metropolitan point of view. And in my constituency and across rural Scotland, women continue to be marginalised in rural areas. A lack of employment opportunities, difficulty accessing childcare and long entrenched stereotypes and the remoteness uh, of locations all contribute to rural women often being in a worse position than sometimes urban women. And growing up in rural Welsh borders, I was all too aware of the challenges women faced. We were expected to carry out manual jobs on the farm, just like men, but were never necessarily rewarded or respected in the same way. And um, I want to highlight 
the role that women played uh, during and after World War II, uh, which was an extraordinarily important role in farming, working the land and in assuming, assuming the role of men who were serving. However, attitudes towards women in agriculture did not change despite uh, this uh, and assumed natural successor in farm businesses can tend to be uh, male. And I, however, was unfortunate and just want to highlight that, um, as I did in my maiden speech, that my own father asked if I would like to take over the farm uh, instead of my brother Will. Um, and I worked alongside my siblings um, from a very young age. And when he asked me, it came as a bit of a shock. And my response was that I just assumed my brother would be taking over. But as I've said, I was lucky to have a father who did not discriminate because I was a young woman. Um, and I want to make this case uh, for rural women across Scotland. It's... Yeah, of course, I'll just finish this sentence. But um, it's about driving cultural change and uh, traditionally what has been a male-dominated sector. Yeah, I'll take a... An Emma Harper. Um, thank you, Rachel Hamilton, for taking the intervention. Does she recognise the really important work of the Women in Agriculture Task Force and how it is raising awareness of women in the agricultural sector? Yep. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you. I thank Emma Harper for that intervention. And it's a very important point she makes about the... Um, Women in Agricultural Task Force. I do believe it sends a very positive message to women in rural areas and welcome their report very much. Um, shows the significant barriers that women do face, as I've just highlighted. Um, I, I do think, though, that the Scottish Government, as again I've mentioned in this chamber, should make further targeted interventions improving rural childcare. We learned today that a major recruitment drive is needed to ensure an expansion of funded nursery places will reach the summer deadline. And this is serious, and it has a serious impact on people living in rural communities. Moreover, in rural areas, uh, local colleges are important to education because universities are often uh, located further away and are not necessarily uh, the right place uh, for some people who want to study part-time. So I would like to see more change um, achieved and the gender balance across those important subject areas in Scottish colleges. In 2016, the FSC committed to increasing the minority gender share in the most imbalanced subjects. Its aim was uh, to be no greater than a 75-25% by 20. Uh, 30, and an Audit Scotland report stated that progress towards addressing the long-standing gender imbalances has been limited and requires a concerted effort from schools, colleges and wider society in making sustainable change. And, and I, I'd like, um, in closing, uh, for the Scottish Government to address how they intend to address those issues and on that point encourage more gov uh, girls into STEM subjects, uh, particularly in engineering and agriculture. Presiding officer, I'm sure I speak on behalf of uh, my female colleagues across the chamber when I say that we must root out discrimination and harassment in our society, especially that which is directed to women, uh, whether in an urban or rural sphere. Online abuse is a major part of the issue, and I believe it's putting off a large section of young women from thinking of running for office. When it comes to abuse and harassment, in my year, four years as an elected member, as many of us have, I've experienced multiple instances of misogynistic abuse and indeed veiled threats. Even 100 years after women were given the right to vote, and we've seen two female prime ministers, there are those who treat democratically, democratically elected women with disdain. It sends a very negative message to young women and girls who wish to run for public office or who have aspirations of operating at a high level within a company. Women's political representation and workplace equality were both discussed in the Scottish Human Rights Commission's progress report to the UN's Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and where Scotland is in terms of women's rights. It is highlighted that we all know there is room for improvement in terms of political representation for women. Scotland's led the way but dropped from fourth place in 2003 to 27th place in 2017 on the global stage. We just need to do more to convince women that their place can be here in Parliament. I want to thank those in my own party and uh, for the work that they're doing through Women to Win, which is a fantastic um, uh, movement which encourages and mentors and trains and, ne and gives op networking opportunities to young women. 
and the Scottish Conservatives uh, with Nashina Mubarak were also uh, leading the way with this diversity commission to increase female and BME candidates. And I know we have a long way to go, 19%. Overall here in the Parliament, 35%. In conclusion, I want to finish with a quote from Jenny Murray, if I may, presiding officer. She said, a woman who has education, passion, and, as is the case for so many, a father who supports his sons and daughters in absolutely equal measure can achieve what she believes is right, just as a man can. And I want women to, and girls to know, no matter where they are, who they are, they can draw inspiration from this and realise the sky's the limit. Thank you. Paul Pauline McNeill for up to six minutes, please. Thank you very much. A happy International Women's Day to all women when it comes on Sunday. And we'd be delighted to support the government motion at today in an excellent speech from Christina McKelvey. I realise that this year's theme is Each for Equal, bringing together the next generation of women and girl leaders, and rightly so. But before I address the specific theme of this debate, I cannot ignore the worrying fact that male violence against women is on the increase, even though there has been a fall in violent crime in Scotland. And of course, the actual figures will be considerably higher than statistics suggest because of low reporting of these types of crimes. But women will never be equal if we are not safe from violence. Because what in the UK, one in four women will experience domestic abuse or one in five sexual assault during our lifetime. And globally, staggeringly, this rises to one in three. Here in Scotland, if you're murdered, it's most likely to be at the hands of your partner or former partner. 60% of total homicides last year of women were by their partner or former partner. According to the UN, the Beijing Platform for Action, signed in 1995, it is recognised as the most progressive roadmap for the empowerment of women and girls everywhere. But the year is a pivotal year for advancing gender equality worldwide as the global community takes stock of the progress made for women's rights since the adoption of the Beijing Platform for Action. The emerging global consensus, as you might expect, is that despite some progress, real change has been agonisingly slow for the majority of women and girls in the world. Today, not a single country can claim to have achieved gender equality. Multiple obstacles remain unchanged in law and in culture, as Rachel Hamilton, I think, has nicely demonstrated today. And women and girls continue to be undervalued, they work for more, and they earn less and have fewer choices. But we won't get anywhere near our goals until such times as we tackle male violence and male control over women's lives. And I do acknowledge the work that this government have done on the issues of forced marriage, child marriage internationally, female genital mutilation, domestic violence, controlling and coercive behaviour, and something I hope to raise this week is the sex for rent scandal in the housing sector. And this prevents many women from living the best lives that they can in reaching their few, full potential. And it's why I think that the theme itself should never forget that until we are safe, we will not be equal. We must, as women parliamentarians, be clear that we have to do work to do and hopefully in many occasions a solidarity with our sisters around the world, but recognising this parliament has made great strides. Yes, I'll be taking intervention from Sandra White. Sandra White. Yeah, I thank Pauline McNeill for taking intervention and the reason of the violence against women. Would uh, Pauline and McNeill agree with me that financial independence, obviously linked to equal pay, is something that women desperately need because that would lead to control from men? Pauline McNeill. That the women need independent financial uh, control over their own lives and that is central um, to making their, uh, their, their decisions. But key to addressing different aspects of sex discrimination as identified in the motion, there are many layers of discrimination. I wanted to mention the disadvantage of discrimination that BME women face in their everyday lives and I believe more have to be done, particularly to protect Muslim women uh, by looking at the guidance and keeping them safe and particularly those who feel vulnerable when wearing headscarves. And I commend the work of Anna Starwa and others on the work last week on Islamophobia. Last month in Turkey, they introduced a law which will allow men accused of having sex with girls under 18 to avoid punishment if they marry their victims. It's hard to believe it in this day and age. Controversial so-called uh, marry a rapist bill has sparked fury among women right campaigners in Turkey itself. Over a third of Turkish women 
has suffered physical or sexual violence from a partner, according to the United Nations. And similarly, this type of legislation and these legal provisions have been in the statute books of other countries in the Middle East and North Africa. But thanks to the wonderful work of women activists across these countries, in Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, Tunisia and Palestine, uh, they've removed these loopholes in recent years. Male violence against women is global and therefore we must work globally. This month marks five decades since the movement, then called the Women's Liberation, had its first conference in Ruskin College in Oxford. It had four key demands, equal pay, equal education, job opportunities, free contraception, abortion on demand, and 24-hour nurseries. Not only focused on the demands for equal pay, you talked about the work predominantly done by women, such as care work, which was less valued. You can see that these themes still remain, these themes still remain today. Single parent families continue to be mostly women and make up nearly a third of families in Scotland and over half of these families are living in poverty. And it's estimated to rise to almost two thirds by 2021 as a result of welfare reform. And that's why I argued for the amendment to the Child Poverty Act to take account of the specific hardship faced by single parents um, because women and children are living in poverty. The law on equal pay for men and women is clear. Not only should men and women be paid the same for the same job, but they should also be paid the same for doing the work of equal value. As that is still in dispute with over 35,000 uh, women members of its female workforce over equal pay, and it's actually lost four appeals so far. So when are ASDA and other companies like this going to realise that women expect to get paid the same as men for work of equal value? And the Court of Appeal has agreed with this. Now over 100 co-op shop floor workers are seeking up to six years of back pay and the latest equal pay claim being brought against another major supermarket. We come to a close. So in conclusion, presiding officer, there has been progress since the first days of the women's liberation movement, but we know we have a long way to go. As we celebrate 50 years of the P Equal Pay Act and the 10th anniversary of the Equality Act, we are know our fight against male dominance will last for a long time to come. Let's ensure that these acts which have served the interests of women well continue to make sure they do in the years to come. Thank you. We are a bit pushed for time. Can I ask Patrick Harvey, then followed by Alex Cole Hamilton, to stick to six minutes, please? Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I welcome the chance to take part in, in this debate. Several members have already uh, mentioned the, the tagline for the uh, the International Women's Day this year, each for equal. And under this theme, I've seen campaigners uh, particularly highlighting the important contribution of women in the economy and levels of, of economic inequality in the labour market. Uh, research by Close the Gap, for example, found that closing the gender gap in employment would be worth up to £17 billion for the Scottish economy. Measuring value in this way can be reductive. Uh, we should want a more equal world on principle, not just for economic reasons. And as someone who is wildly impressed, uh, for example, uh, by the voice of uh, Greta Thunberg, one of the world's most inspiring voices uh, on climate change, a young woman who speaks with both anger and clarity uh, at an in an incredible way, and who uses her platform to lift up the voices of others, not just to, to speak for herself, uh, I think it's important to recognise this is not just about the economy. But looking at some of the economic metrics does help to demonstrate the scale of change that we still need to see. Uh, women's pay is still 50% lower across the whole workforce than men's, and since 2011 the gender pay gap has only fallen uh, by 0.9% uh, for full-time employees. And the the information on this is available from SPICE that should shock us all about the lack of progress. These issues were being highlighted to me this morning uh, when I visited the, the UCU picket line at Strathclyde University, uh, where people are campaigning on pay, workload, and casualization, as well as the gender pay gap. All these issues linked together in one campaign. The combined impact of low pay, precarious work, and the way that workload impact on family life, given the unequal distribution of caring work, exacerbates the existing gender pay gap and the, the lack of women in highly promoted posts within the sector. It's true that we've seen good progress on certain issues, and I, uh, I want to echo the comments that have already been made about Monica Lennon's uh, bill on period products. It's been estimated uh, that it'll cost a woman over £5,000 in her lifetime to purchase period products. And the, 
the Parliament has agreed now that that's not acceptable uh, and indeed eradicating this cost barrier uh, is imperative. Monica Lennon is due great credit for her work on this as are those from across the spectrum and in particular those in the SNP who've made sure that the government came to see the case for supporting that bill. Uh, they're all due congratulations uh, for working across party lines on that. It's not a destination in itself uh, and it should engage members' minds on the, the size of the task that remains ahead of us on, on issues like uh, women's reproductive rights uh, as well as pay, as I've mentioned, the experience of marginalised women such as those in ethnic minority communities, trans and non-binary communities, we've still got a long way to go. For example, we haven't taken some of the steps that are open to us on reproductive rights. Under the 1967 Abortion Act, there is still no legal right to an abortion in Scotland without the permission of two doctors. And since the most recent Scotland Act, that power now sits with this devolved parliament, as I think it should have done from the start. It was an anomaly to devolve all of health and all of justice from the start of, of devolution in 99, but to have abortion seen as an exception. Whether you regard it as a criminal matter or a health matter, it should have been seen as part of the devolution settlement. We can now, and I think we should, take the obvious step of decriminalisation, as many reproductive healthcare professionals have called for. And provision uh, for late-term abortion is still not what it needs to be in this country. I was really pleased when I saw the motion uh, and its important recognition in the text uh, of the, the role of taking an intersectional approach. And I think I'm right in saying it's the first time, if we agree that motion tonight, that'll be the first time this Parliament's expressed a view on that. Uh, and I hope we do so unanimously. I know that for some people, intersectionality sounds awful jargony. Uh, and it, it, can, it can be a, a, a little bit of a, a, a tongue twister sometimes. And I think that's partly because the idea originates in, in a lot of US thinking. And in American English, an intersection is a piece of everyday language. Uh, and so intersectionality is much closer to something uh, that feels uh, uh, accessible as, a, as a, an everyday concept, the way things meet at, at a crossroads. At root, it's a simple and powerful idea that we need to recognise the different ways in which inequality, prejudice and discrimination can play out. Neither people as a whole nor groups of people are homogenous. Gender inequality impacts in different ways on women who are white and women who are black and minority ethnic communities, uh, on women who are disabled and women who are not, on women who are well off and women who are living in poverty, uh, on women who are trans, on those who choose to identify as cisgendered, and on those who don't uh, hold any gender identity at all. In Scotland, we've got a large number of women's organisations who've been doing fantastic work over the years, such as on gender, Scottish Women's Conventions, Zero Tolerance, and many others, supporting women and working on a proudly intersectional ethos. An assumption uh, that all women are not trans would be every bit as wrong in this, as an assumption that all women are, are white or able-bodied or heterosexual, and it would be just as likely uh, to continue to create inequality. Presiding officer, I, I welcome the, the chance to debate this. Uh, it took 50 years from the first International Women's Day to equal pay legislation. It's now another 50 years later, and we still haven't fully delivered on it. Uh, we've got a lot more work to do, and I hope that we will unite and unanimously pass the motion tonight. Alex Paul Hamilton, up to six minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I rise with no small degree of relief, given that the three previous International Women's Days it's been my privilege to address this chamber in. I did so as a representative, as an, a, a party which was all male in the Scottish Parliament, and thanks to the Shetland by-election last summer, that is now no longer the case. It's also true that um, when I was first elected to this place, that um, the, our Westminster group was entirely male as well, and now it is majority female. So times change, and in a good way. Um, Rachel Hamilton mentioned Malala, and it is her words, we cannot all succeed when half of us are held back, uh, which underpin the theme for this year's International Women's Day and its hashtag, Each for Equal. International Women's Day is marked the world over and celebrates social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women. The day also calls uh, us on us to mark 
um, the, the need for action in accelerating gender parity. And there are many Scottish organisations, presiding officer, working to that global end. And I just want to uh, talk about one. Scottish Love in Action is a, a Scottish charity supporting the work of marginal marginalised children um, in developing countries over the last 20 years. It supports the work of Voice for Girls in Hyderabad, India. It's a country that the UN calls the most dangerous place in the world to be born a girl. Voice for Girls educates marginalised adolescent girls about their bodies, about their health and their rights. They empower them to stay in education, to not get married underage, and teaches them that they have the right to a life free from violence and abuse. This in turn gives them the voice to speak up for their rights, who in turn usually go on to speak up for their, not just themselves, but for their sisters, their friends, and their mothers. While Scottish Love in Action and Voice for Girls currently support girls, both of these NGOs also support boys. They acknowledge, and it's critical to acknowledge, that to improve the position of girls and women, it is also necessary to educate the boys around them, to stop the perpetuation of gender inequality of schools as well as to address the existence of it in our society at large. Initiatives to promote gender equality in and through schools are imperative, not just in India, but here as well. Because, presiding officer, gender disparity is not limited to other countries or other cultures. I often quote Coretta Scott King, because I think her words are very apposite here, that the struggle for equality is never ending. You have to win it with each and every generation. And there is such truth in those words, and you don't have to look very far to see the measure of the struggle for equality that falls to our generation in this country and at this time. Because, Deputy Presiding Officer, women still only make up 36% of the members in this chamber, 23% of council leaders, 13% of senior police officers, and only 6% of national newspaper editors. The distance we still have to travel in pursuit of gender inequality in Scotland in 2020 can be seen in those numbers and in the actions of those men in positions of power who still use that influence as a means to molest the women beneath them. It can be seen in the gender pay gap and in maternity discrimination that still cling stubbornly to our workplaces. And it can be seen in the reality that Holyrood has taken a full 20 years to discuss, let alone grapple with period poverty. Presiding officer, my life has been filled with the impact of extraordinary women. And I have mentioned my great aunt Joan before, but I will do so again today. Because in April 1940, she worked in the Foreign Office Intelligence as part of the British legation to Oslo. She stood side by side with celebrated spy chief Frank Foley burning intercepts as the Ver Wehrmacht divisions overran her city. As a key member of the Foley group, she helped to rescue the Norwegian government and king, escaping overland by car and through snow to Lillehammer and onto the coast. And from there, she provided vital communication support to the Norwegian resistance as she evacuated eventually back herself by submarine to Britain. She was awarded an MBE in 1941 at the New Year's Honours List for her service, and she was only 23 years old. I had wished I had known her. In her short career, she was present in some of the most defining moments in global history. She was part of the delegation at Yalta, and I can only imagine the diplomat that she would have gone on to become had she not been sadly lost to us when her plane disappeared over the Atlantic on her return journey from the San Francisco Conference, which established the United Nations at the end of the war. When I think about my great aunt Joan, I am reminded of the frontiers that she had to push back on as a young woman in a man's world. That she was decorated and mentioned in dispatches several times in the male-dominated landscape of military espionage. It is testimony to her strength and the character of her resilience. And I see that strength in the women in my life today. I honour them for it. Presiding officer, I will conclude by saying this. There are more statues to animals in Edinburgh than there are to women. And the exploits of powerful and inventive men are much more readily memorialized and mythologized on banknotes and in school textbooks. The greatness of women in our nation's history is seldom brought to the fore. This is why we need International Women's Day. There is a letter in my attic, presiding officer, from Anthony Eden, who as foreign secretary wrote to my great-grandparents expressing concern over my great aunt Joan's disappearance. Whilst it's quite something, for me to have a letter in my possession that was signed by someone who would later go on to become Prime Minister. I keep it and I treasure it for the memory of Joan and all that she achieved. I will use it to inspire my own daughter when she's old enough to understand that the greatness of women is nothing new.
We now move to the open debate, um, short of time, so there'll be no additional time for the interventions. Six minute speeches. Uh, Rona Mackay, followed by Alison Harris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's a pleasure to speak in this debate to celebrate International Women's Day 2020. As we've heard, the theme this year is Each for Equal, which highlights the fact that everyone, not just women, can play a part in taking action to create a more equal world. Individual actions do make a difference. The IWD website says, an equal world is an enabled world. Individually, we're all responsible for our own thoughts and actions all day, every day. We can actively choose to challenge stereotypes, fight bias, broaden perceptions, improve situations and celebrate women's achievements. Collectively, each one of us can help create a gender equal world. Actually, I find it pretty incredible that in 2020, we're still having to fight for our equality. Presiding officer, before I go on to outline the work the Scottish Government is doing to advance gender equality, I'd like to make some general points. The Minister um, used a word describing women in a tweet recently that I really liked. It was the word sheroes. And if I recall, she was referring to the wonderful Catherine Johnson, the NASA mathematician, who died last week at the grand old age of 101. Anyone who's seen the film Hidden Figures, which I highly recommend, will know exactly who I mean. This amazing woman of colour guided the first manned space flights and the first moon landing by sheer mathematical genius, overcoming racial and gender prejudice to do so. To state her contribution to our world during her long lifetime would take a lot longer than six minutes. Catherine was a shero, as are the fantastic team of three women scientists, Italian and Polish, who've isolated the Italian strain of coronavirus. As are the brave women who spoke out against Harvey Weinstein and sparked the Me Too movement. And here at home are amazing women's aid workers such as Dr. Marcia Scott and her team, along with too many women support workers and third sector organisations to mention, but they know who they are. An article in the National Newspaper at the weekend by Karen Boyle pointed out that in Scotland, the rape crisis movement predates the Me Too movement by 40 years. These women are all sheroes, every one of them. But, presiding officer, it's not just women who hit the headlines or change the world that are, that are heroes. It's the woman who works full time, gets her kids out to school with clean uniforms and everything they need. The single mum who puts food on the table, often going hungry so that her kids can eat. The woman caring for elderly parents or disabled children. Women juggling every day to make uh, a better life for them and their families. They're exceptional and they're all everyday heroes. Presiding officer, last November, I led a members debate to highlight the amazing art installation, Glass Walls, initiated by Dr. Emma Forbes, a principal procurator for Frisco. Anyone who saw the exhibition in Parliament or in the city chambers will know how powerful it was in portraying a woman's experiences of domestic violence. The project was assisted by women from Glasgow's DAISY project, survivors of domestic abuse who bravely come together for, for support and to support those going through it. They're all heroes in my book. Domestic violence is the scourge of society, not just in Scotland, but globally. It's a fundamental violation of human rights. I'd like to congratulate Ricky Ross and Lorraine McIntosh for their work with SKIAF to raise awareness of the desperate plight of women on the Congolese border. Sadly, this is just one of the many areas throughout the world where women are treated horrifically. As co-convener of the cross-party group on men's violence against women and children, our meetings focus on what we can do and what's being done to tackle this outrage here in Scotland. The Scottish Government has a range of policies to deal with violence against women and girls and to advance gender equality. Our record £30 million investment in equalities will help create a Scotland where everyone is protected and violence, discrimination and gender-based inequality are consigned to history. But it is an uphill struggle and one which must start with educating our boys as early as possible help them to become the new generation which calls out men's violence against women at every level. Presiding officer, as the minister outlined, the Scottish Government has recently announced a deli delivering equally safe fund of £13 million, pound, 13 million pounds for services to pre protect women and girls from gender-based violence. The fund will give frontline services an extra £1 million pounds a year and shows how seriously we take erasing the terror and damage of gender-based violence from our society. Of course, we've already introduced groundbreaking legislation that criminalises psychological domestic abuse and launched a range of initiatives, some of which we've heard from other speakers, to support gender equality in schools, universities, colleges and workplaces. So in conclusion, presiding officer, we have come a long, long way 
but there is much work to do. I hope that together we can collectively deliver equality throughout the world for future generations of women and girls. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alison Harris, followed by Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to speak in this International Women's Day debate. Sunday is, as we've already heard, International Women's Day, and people from all over the world will celebrate the economic, cultural, social and political achievements of women. The day also marks a call to action for accelerating gender parity. As I'm here in the chamber today, I think it's only right to give a nod to all steps that all political parties have taken in recent years to encourage more women into politics. I'm very proud of my own party's Women to Win campaign to ask her to stand. I have seen its emerging success and I know that in 2021 it will be greater than ever. The first officially named International Women's Day event was held in 1911. Each year there is a different theme and as the motion says this year is hashtag each for equal. Each for equal encourages us to reinforce that an equal world is an enabled world. It asks us in our everyday lives to challenge stereotypes, fight bias, broaden perceptions, improve situations and celebrate women's achievements. Today's motion acknowledges that this year is the 25th anniversary of the 1995 UN World Conference on Women, which produced the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. This platform established that power should be shared between men and women at home, in the workplace and in the wider national and international communities. To celebrate, the United Nations are focusing this year on gender, eh, sorry, generation equality those who grew up in the age of this platform. All in all, Scotland is performing well in achieving the aims set out in the Each for Equal theme. However, I think there is always room for improvement. According to the Office of National Statistics annual release in 2019, the gender pay gap rose from 5.7 to 6.7, which although remaining lower than the UK figure of 8.9%, reminds us all that we cannot rest on our laurels. It's always useful to remember that the gender pay gap is different from equal pay, which, as the motion says, has been enshrined in law in the UK since 1970. The most recent Women in Work Index reported by PwC said that Scotland retains the top performing part of the UK in terms of representation of women in the workplace. And that is a feat which should be celebrated. In terms of the global picture, the World Economics Forum 2020 Global Gender Gap Report revealed that for economic participation and opportunity, it will take 257 years to close the gap between women and men. This forecast is up from the 202 years predicted in the previous report. So that's a step in the wrong direction. Several economic commentators have pointed out that there is a direct link between gender parity and the success of an economy. Increasing equality benefits everyone in society, and that is why it is important that the push for greater female representation happens in all parts of the economy, including in the STEM sectors, which historically have struggled in this regard. A Skills Development Scotland report from June last year revealed that a huge 91.1% of modern apprenticeships starts in STEM frameworks are male. This could lead to longer term problems when it comes to women getting into senior positions within the STEM sectors, therefore affecting measures like these that, and the gender pay gap. There is a current focus on challenging gender stereotypes in Scottish classrooms. I was speaking to a primary school teacher recently who said that when children were asked to draw a scientist, they tended to draw a man in a lab coat with wacky hair. So whilst it's all fun and games, that's the natural image in their minds. So I'm aware of the Gender Equality Task Force in Education and Learning and that they met for the first time last week. And I know I will be very interested to watch the strategy they develop over the next 12 months. Getting rid of gender-based stereotypes can have a huge impact in the number of girls taking on STEM subjects throughout their school career, which improves representations in workplaces when they become women later in life. We need to ensure that girls are not only encouraged to take STEM subjects, 
but the school curriculum is able to accommodate these decisions. That is a focus I would like to see here in Scotland. Globally, many countries are yet to take large steps in bringing about gender equality. In Scotland and the UK, we are fortunately at the point where those larger steps have mostly been taken. At the same time, we should also take the remaining smaller steps so that we ac accomplish a gender equal world. A world where no matter what your job is, you take part in equal terms irrelevant of your gender. The world in which um, my children grew up in is very different from the world in which I grew up in. And I know that the world of the next generation will be different again. And I think we must always keep pushing forward and trying to make that difference. On International Women's Day this year, let's celebrate how far we have come, but let's also consider the next generation and the world in which we want them to grow up in. Thank you. Thank you. Ruth McGuire, followed by Elaine Smith. Presiding officer, as the minister said in opening, progress towards male and female equality has been made, but we're nowhere near there yet. With no amendments into the government motion, it seems we have cross-party consensus on upholding and protecting the rights of women and girls. Good. The rights of women and girls are fundamental human rights that have been fought for long and hard and should be defended vigorously. That fight is not over. There's still so much to do. Female genital mutilation, prostitution and sexual slavery. Globally, women and girls are being refused access to education and are trapped in conflicts in which rape is used as a weapon of war. Domestic violence is still a terrifying, terrorising reality for far too many. Around the world, sex-selected abortions are rising. The number of deaths related to pregnancy and childbirth is needlessly high. And women and girls are prevented from making deeply personal choices about their reproductive health care. In 2020, women and girls in Scotland should be under no illusion that the fight for women's liberation is won. And I would go as far as to say that in some ways the world feels less equal and more dangerous for women and girls, not safer. Of course progress has been made in many areas and I wholeheartedly welcome that. At a time when the spectrum of men's violence against women seems at epidemic proportions, I'm glad for the Scottish Government's action, both in terms of funding frontline services and legislation. I'm very proud of the groundbreaking legislation that criminalises psychological abuse recognising the reality for victims and that the terror inflicted on them is not just physical and certainly not, not one-off events, but a continuum of coercive and controlling behaviour. That legislation will protect many women and girls. But we also have to talk about the increase in women and girls who are being killed and injured in violence that it is claimed to be consensual. I agree with the We Can't Consent to This campaign which does not believe that women can consent to their grievous injury or death, and which believes that they certainly do not invite male violence that kills them. The claim of sex game gone wrong must not become the new she was asking for at defence. There is work to be done there. At a time where girls and women in this country are at risk of undergoing the unnecessary and painful procedure with lasting health consequences, I'm glad that we have political consensus on the FGM bill which, when enacted, will provide the option of protection orders, which female survivors have told us will help to keep girls and women safe from this particular affront to their human rights. But we also have to talk about the fact that women and girls affected need more than just protection orders. They need health care in a dignified and culturally appropriate setting, and not just for their maternity care. They need housing and they need support. There's work to be done there. And as long as female bodies are objectified, commodified and reduced to something to be bought and sold, used and traded, we will not have equality or justice and women and girls will continue to suffer violence. At a time when Teen Vogue, Teen Vogue suggests prostitution as a job like any other to girls and young women, when the most common search criteria on a porn site are about abuses of women, abuses of girls, violence and rape, and sex for rent adverts can still be seen. I'm very grateful that the Scottish Government is clear on its position on the violence of prostitution and, importantly, is considering a more robust approach to tackling male demand for prostituted women and girls. I also welcome Minister Ashdenham's announcement this morning of a fund to do that to challenge demand. But welcome as this is, there's further work around the sexualisation of culture 
and the joining up of the dots around the continuum of commercial sexual exploitation and violence. There's still work to be done. Women as a sex class do not have equality and the fight is not over, not in this country and not globally. The rights of women and girls must be upheld, protected, advanced and defended vigorously. All humans have human rights and as parliamentarians we have a responsibility as human rights defenders, a responsibility I know we all take very seriously. But to do the work, the work we all agree needs to be done and much of it outside this chamber, women must be free to gather and talk, to organise. They must be free to gather, free from the threat of violence, free from threats to their livelihoods. Talking about women's rights, prioritising women and girls, does not mean disregarding or not caring about the rights of others, but it may well mean difficult conversations. And we have to be honest that sometimes rights might appear to come into conflict. Pretending otherwise does everyone a disservice and brings us no closer to the equal society that we all want to see. Presiding officer, I would just close by um, acknowledging all the work that's being done and saying that I'm willing to play my part in the much more work that needs to be done still. Thank you, Ms. McGuire. I call Elaine Smith to be followed by Sandra White. Ms. Smith, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm very pleased to be able to contribute to this debate in advance of International Women's Day on the 8th so that we as women parliamentarians can mark the occasion in the Chamber. Over the years since I was first elected in 1999, I've contributed to a great many debates about women and girls, sex inequality and sex discrimination. But unfortunately, over the same period, this parliament has dropped from second place in the world in terms of women's parliamentary representation in 2003 to 35th place now. I'm proud to represent a party with a record of championing equality for women of all backgrounds, which has used affirmative action to increase women's representation. However, we must all do better in increasing the representation of black and minority ethnic women and women with disabilities. And since women are still underrepresented in this chamber, I hope that all political parties will take action to address this for next year's election. And maybe once a year to celebrate International Women's Day, we can have a debate in the chamber solely filled by women MSPs. As we know, a critical mass of women can make a difference by having an inherent understanding of sex inequality and of specific issues that women need addressed. As the Minister said, we've led the way in this Parliament in that regard with legislation on domestic abuse, my own breastfeeding legislation, and only last week Monica Lennon's period poverty bill past stage one, to name but a few. So we can recognise and congratulate ourselves as government and as legislators on the work we've done to help address the unequal treatment of women. But there is still much to do, and sadly many of the issues remain the same as those we faced back in 1999. The, theme, uh, the UN theme this year is Each for Equal, as we've heard, which highlights the personal responsibility of each one of us to challenge women's inequality. I do support that. But I think I must also emphasise the need for collective action. Gloria Steinem, world-renowned feminist, once said, the story of women's struggle for equality belongs to no single feminist, nor to any one organisation, but to the collective efforts of all who care about human rights. Presiding officer, we can be under no illusion worldwide the fight for women is as real and urgent as it was when socialist women from 17 countries came together in 1910 to claim a day as theirs and to highlight the struggle of working women. Here in Scotland, recent police Scotland figures show that the levels of domestic abuse where sex is known, showing that 79% of incidents involved a female victim and a male perpetrator, and 94% of rapes and attempted rapes had a female victim. Women are 52% of the Scottish population, and yet we remain massively underrepresented in the public sphere. According to Engender, of the 39 different public areas they researched, only five had achieved 50% women. Men are still overrepresented in positions of authority and influence in Scotland. And the Sex and Power in Scotland report, uh, this Sex and Power in Scotland report that Engender recently produced is sobering reading. I would recommend it for everyone. Men are tenaciously holding on to their power in the boardrooms, local councils, schools, universities, in this parliament, in fact, everywhere. And the dominance of men is good for no one. It doesn't reflect the needs of the Scottish population and it perpetuates inequality for women and marginalised groups. 
with nine women judges out of 34 at the Supreme Court and two women senior police officers out of a total of 15, it's no surprise that the one in five Scottish women who will experience domestic abuse within their lifetime are struggling to get access to justice. Low conviction rates for rape, domestic abuse, trafficking of women for sexual exploitation, together with one of the highest levels of women's imprisonment in Northern Europe, are clear evidence that justice and the law are just not working for women in Scotland. And the statistics that I've quoted show the absolute need for data gathered on the basis of sex so that we can see these patterns. Over the coming week, Scotland's local councils also will yet again be forced to cut local services because of underfunding and women and children will bear the brunt of these cuts and closures of services upon which they rely. And we shouldn't forget that Professor Philip Alston, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, noted the unequal burden of austerity borne by women in the UK when he visited and did the report in 2018. I would uh, like to briefly mention a social enterprise project that I learned about last week, which is partially funded by the Scottish Government, Access to Safety. It's been set up to help overcome the barriers to services that uh, black and minority ethnic women can experience, including services for domestic abuse, rape and sexual abuse, exploitation or abuse of cultural practices. The service provides interpreters trained in recognising violence against women and trauma response, and it's a service to empower women helping some of the most vulnerable women in Scotland and creating jobs for marginalised women who speak their languages. Presiding officer, in conclusion, I want to mention the fact that 10 years after the Equality Act 2010 was passed, the sex-based rights for women recognised in that Act are being questioned by some and there are attempts to silence women who want to discuss these legal rights. These rights are vital, for example, in providing safe spaces for women, free from the presence of men, ensuring that women can have female providers for personal intimate care requirements and that women can organise politically against sex-based oppression by males. The very suggestion of their removal is a timely reminder that we can never be complacent about our past achievements and as Democrats and parliamentarians, we have a duty to speak up and not allow our voices to be silenced by men. Just last week, Michelle Bachelet, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, warned against complacency in women's rights at an event marking the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration. According to Ms Bachelet, the risk of setbacks to women's rights are real and growing, and I will finish with her words when she called on the international community to resist any challenge to a hard-won affirmation, namely that women's rights are human rights. Can I wish all my sisters in the Parliament a happy International Women's Day when it comes. Thank you very much. And I call Sandra White to be followed by Morris Corey. Ms White, please. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, like others, I, I do very much welcome this debate in celebration of International Women's Day. The motion gives all of us an opportunity to highlight the contribution women make across society, nationally and internationally, as well as the injustices it's been spoken of that women continue to face. And I think it is fitting that we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Equal Pay Act and I would like to focus my contributions today on that, and in particular on the Glasgow City Council women's workers, who after many years finally received justice in their case for equal pay and conditions. Now, I'd like to start with a, a bit of the background to the case. In 2007, an unequal, as we now know, pay and grading scheme was introduced at Glasgow City Council as part of the single status agreement, which was implemented across Scottish local authorities. However, Glasgow decided to go with a uniquely amended version of a scheme used by London local authorities. And as a result of the predominantly female occupation groups were transferred into an arm's length organisation called Cordia. These women were subjected to a discriminatory measures which reduced earnings and value compared to the mainstream Glasgow City Council employees. Overtime rates were reduced, pay rises were not applied to quarterly earnings, and oppressive shift systems and increased workloads imposed. Presiding officer, this largely, largely female workforce were ensuring our elderly and vulnerable were supported. Catering services were running smoothly, cleaning services, uh, delivering across schools, nurseries, libraries, care homes, museums, and home care in the community. However, this is good news, by working together and showing, I think, huge strength and determination over a an unbelievable 12-year period, these women won their case and ensured parity for women workers of the future. It was these women who fought against, which was then Labour-run council, who by all accounts spent more than £2.5 million in defending this discriminatory policy. I have absolutely 
agree with the commentators at the time that say this was an incredible waste of public money and a betrayal to those women employees. And who knows how much many more thousands would have been paid. And I do pay tribute and congratulation to the many women, but also the SNP Glasgow City Government for tackling this and bringing forward justice. So with the marking of the 50th anniversary of the Equal Pay Act 1970, this is a case we should all be applauding. But despite this legislation and the landmark victories for women over the years, pay discrimination re remains, as some have said, a persistent cause of the gender pay gap. We're still quite away from realising the right to equal pay for equal work. Pay discrimination affects individual women and is a feature of female-dominated jobs and sectors, which I've just illustrated in the Glasgow case. And I would argue that the uh, problem in the economy, uh, economy and the values of what we do and has done on for generations probably go further and really put the cat amongst the pigeons and say that I believe a lack of understanding, and that's me being polite here, a lack of understanding for a predominantly male hierarchy has led to systematic discrimination. The closing the gap briefing that we received and thanked them very much for that, for this debate, made interesting reading and disappointing reading also. Research by them on employer action on the pay gap found that while 94% of employer surveys had an equal pay policy, less than a third had undertaken an equal pay review and only 3% had taken any action to address the pay gaps. It goes on to say that this undue complacency amongst employers is also evidence in UK Government Equalities Office research on reporting of gender pay gap with the majority of employers surveyed, 62% had no current, past or planned future involvement in pay reviews because they considered that they already provided equal pay. The Scottish Government, I will. Julie Martin. Um, Grateful for Sandra the White for giving an intervention. The legislation that came from UK government only asked companies over a certain amount to actually report in the gender pay gap. But she joined with me in agreeing that there should actually be a duty to close the gender pay gap if that, that gap is quite wide. I'm I'm absolutely, I'm absolutely agree with Gillian Martin, as I'm sure we all will. And basically, I, I want to show the difference. And we know that the Scottish government is making progress, progress in the most recent gender pay gap figures and it indicates that Scotland is still outperforming the UK as a whole. And the Gender Pay Cap Action Plan published in March last year by the Scottish Government has over 60 actions to tackle the root causes of the gender pay gap and reduce it by 2021. However, key tools required to adequately address the gender pay gap, such as employment laws, remain under the control of the UK Parliament. And what a great pity that this is not devolved to this Parliament and maybe we could update as Gillian Martin has mentioned as well. In closing, President Officer, I would like to reflect on the theme of this year's International Day celebration, Each for Equal. I wholeheartedly agree that we should all be responsible in creating and delivering a more equal world. And I hope the majority of people, and I'm sure they do, feel the same way. We need action by everyone, and I'd advocate taking inspiration from the women who were so unfairly treated for such a long time by Glasgow City Council. They showed determination and belief in equality and when their fight seemed winnable, they did carry out galvanised support and they won. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you, Ms White. And I call Maurice Corrie to be followed by Joan McAlpin. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy <laughs> Presiding Officer. It is indeed a privilege to join in this debate today and celebrate the upcoming International Women's Day next week. Uh, I have been fortunate enough to have lived and worked in, in several parts of the, of the world, and particularly in Bosnia, Afghanistan, and the Middle East. Uh, where I've seen women's position in society there vary immensely. International Women's Day is, of course, about celebration. Celebrating that what women have achieved, what progress we continue to see in all areas of gender equality, not only in Scotland, but in the countries across the globe. But it is also about advocating for what still needs to be done to raise awareness of those barriers which still exist for women and girls in sport, in health, the economy, politics, to name just but a few, and to tackle them head on with practical and loud change. Equal for Equal, our theme for this year, centers on the idea that equality is an, is an advantage, and not just for women, but for everyone. And as phrased by the UN, women and girls represent half of the world's population, and therefore, by dint of this, also half of its potential. For communities and wider economies to witness the growth and productivity they need to develop, 
This potential must be recognised and utilised at every level. Employment opportunities for women in the UK have gradually widened over the years, and indeed since 1971 there has been an increase of almost 70% in the number of women in employment, and across more and more companies we are witnessing a rise in more progressive workplace cultures, ones which emphasise that a flexible working environment attracts a more diverse and talented workforce. An increasing number of women are starting their own micro-businesses, creating their own, uh, their own career paths with greater independence. And I can go back as far as the 1980s when the British Army, through the, the Sir Thomas Vett report, recognised the careers which wives had themselves uh, in their married life uh, whilst married to an army, uh, army uh, husband, and how this could be encouraged in military life later on. And this was successfully implemented. And yet, despite this, these, advance, these advances, barriers for women in the workplace continue to exist. And for example, the organization Close the Gap has referred to the gendered part-time effect where more women are in lower paid and often undervalued part-time positions. And moreover, underrepresentation of women of color, those with disabilities and those from the LGBT community continues to be a pervasive, a pervasive problem. But recognizing the problem is part of the solution. And for instance, the United Kingdom is one of the first countries to implement the gender pay gap reporting. And this requires private and voluntary sector employers with 250 or more employees to publish their gender pay gap every year. And this goes farther than the argument um, of equal pay for equal work. By mapping the performance of industries and regions, this indicates the wider socio-economic factors which limit women's contribution to the community and the economy. And from this, employers can be held to account while communities can have a greater understanding of how inequalities have taken root and can be addressed. And what is especially vital is that women are included in the decision-making process as strong and welcome participators, and underlying the, the long-held perceptions concerning women's involvement are at best unhelpful and at worst incredibly damaging to the efforts of increasing their, vi their visibility. Aside from my focus on the workplace today, we, was, we still see inequality and discrimination across too many sectors spanning many different countries. This is evident in stereotypes, conscious or unconscious, in policies and laws which serve to restrict and limit women, in societal expectations and traditions, countries which support gender equality in their constitutions are of course not immune to these issues. And yet it's been encouraging to see strides made in Scottish politics to bring us closer to equal gender representation. And for this year, this year's International Women's Day has been inspiring to read of the range of events across Scotland that take place next week. And this includes in my own region of West Scotland, for example, in Glasgow, where it will, they will hold an International Women's Day bike ride and its university will shine a light on women in science. And, and, uh, the, and the Barton Library will host an event named Where Are the Women? which will also look at the many stories of women throughout history who were deserving yet deprived of streets and statues honoring their name and legacy. And finally, to conclude, their presiding officer, International Women's Day is, of course, not just pausing to reflect and advocate for one day of the year. It must go beyond that. Equal for equal means it will take everyone a truly collective effort to champion and support women in innovative and visible ways. It is not a problem solely for the few, but a shared responsi responsibility for all to fix. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Corey. I call Joan McAlpine to be followed by Joanne Lamont. Ms. McAlpine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Like Elaine Smith, I also want to draw the Chamber's attention to Michelle Bachelet, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, comments earlier this week when she warned against complacency regarding women's rights. They cannot be an optional policy, she said, subject to the changing winds of politics. And she's absolutely right. One in three women across the world experience violence perpetrated by men. And between 60 and 100 million women who should be alive today are missing, presumed dead, because of male violence. One woman dies every minute due to problems relating to pregnancy. 15 million adolescent girls around the world have experienced forced sex and multiply that several times over for adult women. 72% of human trafficking victims are female and the vast majority uh, are for the purposes of prostitution. Many of these are children. And women work two out of three of all labour hours worldwide but earn just 10% of the world's income. Last year, new scientists reported that sex-selective abortions have stopped the birth of 23 million girls since 1970. 
They were not aborted because of their gender identity or because they were non-binary. They had no value because they were female. They are one of a number of mar marginalized groups who, excuse me, there are many marginalized groups in the world and they all deserve protection from discrimination. One of the way, ways marginalized groups empower themselves is by organizing themselves and particularly by excluding the group which has been historically responsible for their oppression. So black people form groups excluding white people, gay people have their own groups, so do trans people, indeed Scottish Trans Alliance, have argued to the UK Government's Women and Equalities Committee that the law should be changed to allow for services and organisations exclusively for trans people. And I think that's absolutely reasonable. I also think it is reasonable for women, if they wish, to organise on the basis of their sex. And it's also legal. It's a kernel of decades of feminist thought to say that gender is imposed on women in order to uphold their oppression. By gender, uh, feminists mean presentation, modes of dress, the falsehood of masculine and feminine personality traits. If we say gender is somehow innate, that it supersedes sex, then the logical conclusion is that women can somehow identify out of our oppression, and many feminists disagree with that. But increasingly, this has become a problematic thing to say. Indeed, it's become a dangerous thing to say. This weekend, Selena Todd, the professor of modern history at Oxford University, found herself disinvited from making a short speech at a conference to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the first women's liberation movement meeting in the UK in Ruskin College. Professor Todd's a feminist and a socialist who's written extensively about women's history and working class history. Since 2017, she's been president of the Socialist Educational Association. The decision to silence Professor Todd was not supported by the women attending the conference and has been widely condemned, including by leading feminists such as Caroline Criado Perez and Helen Lewis. But she's one of a growing number of feminist academics who are being censored for their views that biological sex matters and that women as a marginalized group should be allowed to organize themselves according to their own definitions. Indeed, Professor Todd now requires security to attend her work and sadly, she's not alone. Professor Rosa Friedman, an expert in human rights law, who's worked for both the UN and Reading University, has suffered similar abuse. The door of her office at university has been vandalized and urinated on, and she's been followed home by individuals threatening rape and violence. Elsewhere, the philosophy professor, Kathleen Stock, has found herself deplatformed and subject to a sustained campaign trying to have her ejected from her job at Sussex University. Sadly, many other prominent feminists have been subject to similar treatment, including Dame Jenny Murray, mentioned by Rachel Hamilton. Uh, so has Germaine Greer and Helen Lewis, who was subject to online death and rape threats. Lewis was subject to the, this abuse because she criticized a US gamer who posted an image of a woman having her throat cut on the grounds that this woman was a TERF, a trans-exclusionary radical feminist. Sadly, it's not just in England that feminists have been silenced. In Scotland last year, a number of MSPs attended a meeting at Edinburgh University where a number of female academics and writers spoke about women's sex-based rights. One of them was the journalist Julie Bindle. She has spent her life campaigning against male violence, and that was what she spoke about that day. On her way out, accompanied by Professor Friedman, a man lunged at her, screaming abuse. Two security guards had to hold him back. This particular individual had taken the name of an American radical feminist he disliked, and he regularly threatens violence against feminists online. He was later arrested, but I understand that the Crown Office dealt with the matter informally, which is unfortunate in my view. Particularly as the majority of members of this parliament signed a motion afterwards by Jenny Mara, MSP, condemning the attack and asserting our right to discuss sometimes difficult issues, particularly at universities. It's therefore disappointing that subsequent attempts by women to meet, including at Edinburgh University, have been shut down by threats of intimidation. And it's even more worrying that women such as feminist poets in Scotland, Jenny Lindsay and Maggie Gibson, have been subject to online mobs trying to protect, stop them getting work or blocking their performances. And when the Scottish Poetry Library last week said that this was unacceptable, 
there was a letter um, by activists that somehow said that bullying was okay. We can't allow this to happen if we really value women's rights. And I think it's an appropriate time on International Women's Day to highlight this threat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I call Joanne Lamont to be followed by Emma Harper. Ms Harper is the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Lamont, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding yes. Officer. And can I, amongst all very many powerful speeches, commend Joan McAlpin on what she has just said. I know the courage it takes to do that, and I think very many women will be proud of what she has said today. I'm as proud as ever to take part in this debate marking International Women's Day. I look back in my young days when I was realising what inequality for women meant, and I reflect and I remember it as a time of tough challenges. But I remember too the optimism and the exuberance, the excitement of the possible. And I yearn for that optimism now, in a world where some of the debate around women's rights is so difficult, and where labelling women and impugning women's motives have become an unpleasant and corrosive habit amongst those who ought to know better. International Women's Day should be an occasion to remember the battles women fought for equality, reflect on where we are now in terms of women's ability to achieve their potential, and reaffirm our determination to speak up and speak out for women's rights, that our sons and daughters might live their lives as they choose, rather than determined by stereotype and expectation. This is an opportunity to celebrate the past, those women through the generations who were not just pioneers, but made change possible, who showed that women could be lawyers, doctors, engineers, adventurers, inventors, not just wives and mothers, and could wear whatever they liked. Women who fought for equal pay, women who fought for maternity rights, women who fought for the right to work. And in my generation, women who exposed the living reality of women, women whose life chances were entirely shaped by the violence of the men in their lives. Survivors who exposed the reality of domestic abuse, violence against women, sexual abuse and rape. When we see the shocking truth of women being made refugees in their own communities, where women fled violence or stayed and lived with it because it was a domestic. And all too often, women were seen as the authors of their own destiny and where rape in marriage was not even a thing. We celebrate the women who campaigned against male violence, but also the women who created the refugees, the refuges in their own time and with their own resources, supported survivors of male violence. And they did it without the agreement of this or sanction of government or the state. And where they led, society and we now follow, legislating, resourcing women's services, rooted in that understanding. That legacy cannot be overstated and must be protected in all we do here. And we celebrate the women who took the battle into the political domain to tell the brothers that women's rights were fundamental to an equal society rather than something to address once that equal society had arrived. That women's rights were not a bonus. To change the law on employment, inheritance and discrimination. To win the argument that male violence against women was not just personal, but the very stuff and purpose of politics. And we celebrate the women who won the argument for positive action for women's representation to ensure that equality and women's rights were woven in to the fabric of political action, that women are in the room when the decisions are being made. And make no mistake, those conversations, debates and arguments were never easy, but women did not flinch from them and we should not flinch now. No step in the road to equality is ever easy, no power has ever been ceded without resistance, as true now as ever. But energy and passion did make change happen, and we need that energy and passion now. And now in reaffirming our commitment to women's equality, we recognise how much further we have to go. Women remain disproportionately carers. Women disproportionately are low paid. Our girls outperform boys in education, but they are not running the world. Women still face violence and abuse, still coerced, abused, humiliated, killed in their own homes. Just read the newspapers. Across the world, women face violence, female genital mutilation, trafficking, forced into prostitution, denied access to education, even blamed for their own murders. And routinely, the rape of women remains the weapon of choice in war. In reaffirming our resolution to women's equality on International Women's Day, I draw a lesson from my own lifetime, the clear need for women to organize in defense of our own rights. 
the importance of women-only spaces in providing safety and a place to plan. The right to women's spaces comes directly from an understanding of need and from experience and must be protected. What our history tells us fundamentally, when women speak up, speak out and organise, women change the world and they change it for the better for all. Let's celebrate Women's Day by celebrating all those women who have had the courage to change the world. There is much left to do. Thank you very much. And now I've got Emma Harper, then we move to closing speeches. Ms. Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this important debate to mark International Women's Day. And this year, as others have mentioned, we're celebrating the theme of Each for Equal. Each for Equal is about creating an enabled world, a world where internationally women are empowered to be the best they can be. As noted by the United Nations, individually, everyone, male, female and other, are responsible for our own thoughts and actions all day, every day. Everyone has the choice to challenge stereotypes. We can choose to fight bias, we can broaden perceptions and we can improve situations and celebrate the achievements of women. It is important for us all to work to enable this to happen and to strive for gender empowerment and equality. This is such a broad subject and we've heard the discussion and debate today evidenced by colleagues across the whole chamber. And I'd like to focus my contribution on the international and outward looking approach to tackling gender inequality, which we are taking here in Scotland. The Scottish Government has a range of policies to deal with male violence against women and girls and to advance gender equality both here and abroad. And the Minister mentioned the Forensic Medical Services Victims of Sexual Offences Scotland Bill that is coming to Health and Sport Committee uh, is soon. And I look forward to helping take this bill forward as a member of the Health and Sport Committee. And whether here in Scotland or in countries affected by war or indeed anywhere around the world, male violence against women is a fundamental violation of human rights. It's never acceptable, it's never excusable and it's never tolerable. The Scottish Government is therefore rightly investing in frontline services and is bringing forward new legislation to tackle violence and discrimination against women. The Scottish Government has a commitment to acting as a world leader and aims to set an international example of good practice in gender equality and in the eradication of gender-based violence to create a world where women are safe and encouraged to achieve their goals. Over the past year in Scotland, we have seen the implementation of Equally Safe, which is Scotland's strategy to prevent and eradicate all forms of violence against women and girls. And I note Ruth Maguire's powerful contribution this afternoon. As well as the strategy rightly dealing with issues of gender-based violence here in Scotland, it has a commitment to preventing international discrimination against women. Members may recall that in January this year, just on return from recess, I brought a debate forward in chamber on United Nations Security Council Resolution number 1325 on women, peace and security. 20 years ago this year, SCR 1325 was unanimously passed by the UN Security Council. It was the first resolution of its kind with the aim of specifically addressing the impact of war on women and the value of women in the role of resolution and the value of women as promoters of international peace, security and inclusion. Women do, do need to be in the room. Joanne Lamont is absolutely right. When women are in the room to talk about uh, conflict resolution and promoting peace and security, women bring a different perspective to conflict re resolution. They have a focus on health, housing and clean water, not just ceasefires, weapons reduction and securing borders. At the heart of e Equally Safe is the principle that all women and girls, regardless of background, race, religion or sexual orientation, should feel safe in their communities and should be without fear or violence or fear of violence and abuse. Internationally, Scotland, working in partnership with the United Nations, has pledged practical and financial support for women and girls to achieve this goal and to learn peace building and conflict resolution skills. In a programme which runs over three days and consists of talks, seminars and lessons, women and girls have access to international peacekeeping experts, female role models in positions of power and the opportunity to learn from each other about the fundamentals of peacekeeping. This has proved to have a lasting and positive impact on the individuals who are taking part 
and on the future of many war affected areas across the world. But in particular, this has hugely benefited Syria. In doing so, the actions of the Scottish Government have been recognised internationally as having played their part in supporting a peace settlement for Syria, one which is shaped by women as well as men. Presiding officer, our First Minister was the first world leader to address the United Nations General Assembly to discuss the importance of women playing our part both at home and internationally. The First Minister spoke of the importance of societies and countries having a focus on welfare and of peace promotion. There are many other ways in which the Scottish Government is promoting gender equality and the promotion and empowerment of women. All women in Scotland can stand for this parliament and most importantly, we have a dedicated minister for equalities and a commitment to holding, upholding women's rights. In addition, it is also worth noting European countries and indeed other countries around the world who have women leaders, including New Zealand, Germany, Poland and the Scandinavian countries. Recently, I met with the president and vice president of the Nordic Council, both women, both very impressive. Again, I would like to also note the importance of having an outward looking and international approach to tackling issues of violence and discrimination against any of us, as each of us, men, women and others, must work together to promote equality. Presiding officer, in closing, I wish all women the best for this Sunday on International Women's Day. Thank you, Thank you very much. I now call Sarah Boyack to close for Labour. Ms Boyack, please. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Um, I want to start where Christina McKelvey started. At the Beijing Platform for Action in 1995, Hillary Clinton declared that women's rights are human's rights. And that statement was a reminder that the rights and needs of women, whether in the workplace, at home, or society at large, do not and must not exist in isolation from what we consider the norm. They are integral to it. And a key theme today has been that equality for women is good for our economy. But yet, in the 25 years since Beijing, although much has changed, in this parliament, there is still much progress we need to make. If we look at what women have done in terms of leading legislation, whether through directly targeted or in terms of policy and expenditure, legislation on breastfeeding period products, legislation on uh, bus travel for the over 60s, reducing isolation for older women, the provision of childcare, Huge steps forward, but not enough. If we look at the issue of domestic violence, we have had legislation, and women have pioneered that in this parliament. But although we've passed legislation on domestic violence, there is still so much to do. The statistics Pauline McNeill quoted, one in four women affected by domestic violence, and one in five by sexual assault. That cannot be something we are going to accept. There is so much more to do. And the points that were made in the debate about justice the need for more women leaders in the police to make sure we have justice through the police and the courts is absolutely crucial. And that quote from Pauline McNeill, until women are safe, we will not be equal. That is one of the quotes I'm going to take from today. In the briefing we got from Engender, they stated that women, although we're 52% of the population, at the highest levels of business, journalism, the arts, sports, and in public life, women are still underrepresented. And those who are largely are those with the fewest barriers in their way. And the reference in the motion today to intersectional discrimination is really important. Because when we campaign for women's equality, we must ensure that we're working for equality for all women. And that means working to remove the barriers posed by race, class, sexuality, disability, religion, as well as gender. Because equality for only some women is not equality. Elaine Smith made some powerful comments on the need for justice for women who've been subjected to violence. And I think that that is the context to make sure that we're addressing all of those intersectional issues. When you look at the legislation that's been passed in 1970, the Labour government introduced the Equal Pay Act, and then again in 2010, the Equality Act. Both pieces of legislation aim to remove the discrimination women discrimination women have faced and continue to face at work and that has been a theme from several of the speeches this afternoon but if you look at the the gender pay gap in the last 50 years we have not eradicated it and it still sits today at 13.3 percent that isn't acceptable 
for any of us. And the point about women not being equally treated in the economy means that our economy does not perform as well as it should do. The fact that women are still doing 70% of the unpaid labour on care and household responsibilities in Scotland, that is not acceptable. That vital work is worth an estimated 10.8 billion to our economy, so there is still more to do. In our health service, women still face inequalities. Even though women make up 77% of our health workforce in Scotland, only 30.4% of our health service chief executives are women. So more to do there. Rachel Hamilton mentioned the issue of um, making sure that women have access to all areas of employment, regardless of where they live in Scotland, whether in an urban or a rural area. That's absolutely vital. This week, I had the privilege to visit Lothian Buses. It's Apprentice Week, so we went out to visit Lothian Buses. And it was great to hear about the young women being recruited as apprentices, but also the increasing number of women bus drivers. So there's something about challenging what used to be jobs just for women, just for men too. And there are vast discrepancies between the representation of women and men in top positions, and we need to act on that. Decision-making, participation in society, it means that women are not as able as men to fully exercise their citizenship. And when women are missing, so too are their perspectives. And I thought the comments by uh, Rona Mackay about international development, the comments made by Emma Harper, are absolutely central to this debate. In international development work, the contribution of women to tackle um, conflict resolution is really important, not just to get the end to a war or the end to a conflict, but to make the peace afterwards so that people who've been at war can live with each other. That's absolutely crucial. Rona Mackay's comments about the importance of the work of SCIAF, more to be done again there. And the work is absolutely critical. And I think that is something that we must take away from this debate today. One issue I'd ask Christina McKelvey to pick up is the issue of trafficking. Again, it's an issue where we need joined up work on justice, on housing, to make sure that women who've been trafficked don't continue to be oppressed. So there is much to celebrate because we have made some progress. But I want to finish about the issue of women's representation. It's not just an issue in Scotland, and it's been mentioned by several colleagues this afternoon. Globally, less than 25% of parliamentarians are women. Less than 25%. That cannot be acceptable. There are inspirational women. Uh, the references by Patrick Harvey and by Alex Cole Hamilton to Greta Thunberry and Malala are fantastic. They are an inspiration to us all, but they should also be allowed to be decision makers, not just lobbying from the sidelines or activists. We want women with that kind of experience, enthusiasm and passion to be involved in decision making. This year, International Women's Day is about equal for equal, to encourage everyone to play their part in a more equal world. When this parliament was being set up, we experienced a long campaign to get this parliament. Across the parties, there was a lot of political argument, but in terms of women, the STUC and Women in Scotland campaigned to make sure that we had equality. Our first group was 50-50, and it's something that remains unfinished business, not just about women being elected, but a range of women. Women that cross disability, religious, sexual preference, race and class, we need to make sure that all women get access to our decision making. So today is a celebration, but it's also a call for action. Although there's been a lot achieved, there is much more that needs to be done in every level of this country, whether it's representation, um, delivery of policy, or whether it's the budget. There's more to be done. We've not achieved 50-50 yet. There's a long way to go. But that's about the challenge we've had yes. cross-party agreement. Thank Let's you. Let's take Sorry. that out of this room and get some more yep. action. Thank I you, presiding officer. you managed to do seven minutes, but not more. I call Michelle Ballantyne close with Conservatives, please. Thank you, presiding officer, and I'm pleased to, to close with the Scottish Conservatives today. The minister set the scene today by describing some of the progress we are making, whether it's shared maternity leave or the challenge of gender representation in Parliament. And that theme has been picked up uh, across the day. And today I think it is about how we all feel about how we're progressing and how we then contrast and compare that across the world. Rachel Hamilton reminded us how perceptions and expectations in agriculture have changed over the years. 
and we've talked about how education has moved forward. Today, female students represent 52% of the student population. So in that sense, we are equal. But then when you look across the subject, you see a difference again. So when you look to engineering, Engineering UK's 2019 report states that the engineering community must work hard to instill confidence in girls and young women so that they are cap capable of becoming an engineer and believe that and improve their knowledge and perceptions and desirability of engineering. And they state that across key metrics, girls continue to lag behind boys, including perhaps most alarmingly in the extent to which they believe themselves to be capable of becoming an engineer. And when my son graduated an engineer, it really struck me that in his graduation class at Edinburgh University, in his master's class, not only were the majority men, the majority also were Chinese. So I think we have to encourage both our boys and our girls to look for engineering in, in, in Scotland. But as we do this, and as we look at how we move forward, there is absolutely no doubt that the shadow of domestic violence remains despite the, the significant work that has been done by this parliament to tackle it. And I agree that Pauline McNeill's comment that the view, until women feel safe, they will never be equal, is something we should all hold close when we're thinking about the problems that are there. But perhaps the one I will take away with me today is Joan McAlpine's passionate and brave speech around actually the rights of women and the right to be a woman and to have that safe space. Because I think we are seeing almost a backlash now against women for being women. Um, and equality is about choice and it is about freedoms and it is about the ability to, to make the life that you want to make and to say the things that you want to say and to be safe in whatever choice you make. And I think we must make sure that that is protected no matter what. In 2018, I, I spoke in this, this debate, um, and the theme then was press for progress. And I spoke then about my concerns for women across the world who did not have the freedoms and equality that we now enjoy, and that we should press for progress for them. And many speakers today have picked up on that. But this year's theme is each for equal. The idea that we are all individually responsible for challenging and improving gender equality but collectively, we can achieve great outcomes. Emma Harper actually, funny enough, touched on the next thing that I want to talk about, and that was in December 2019. I had the honor and pleasure of speaking at Beyond Borders, the Women in Conflict Fellowship Program, which I think was what you were referring to. This program runs triannually. It's a week-long event, and it brings women from conflict-afflicted countries to Edinburgh to participate in a series of workshops looking at various aspects of conflict resolution and peace building. And on that day, I met 17 amazing, intelligent, courageous women from across the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia. They wanted to hear about what it was like to be a woman in politics in Scotland. And colleagues today have reflected on some of those challenges. And of course, we will not fail to keep working to improve women's life experiences in Scotland but they do not compare to the phenomenal challenges to gender rights, to be able to go to school, to choose who to love and who to marry, to have the right to work and to pursue their own life, lives free from fear that those women that I met experience in their countries, those challenges that they go through on a daily basis. These women have dedicated their lives to resolving conflict and trying to bring about peace so that women and their families do not have to live in fear and they can begin to experience some of the rights that we have discussed here today. I'd love to tell you about all 17 of those women and celebrate them on International Women's Day for their bravery. But as time constrains me, I'll tell you about one. Sudaba was born and grew up in a remote area of Herat province. And she was lucky. Unlike many girls in Afghanistan, she did receive an education. Her father wanted her to learn. And she actually then managed to get a scholarship to the American University of Afghanistan through a US Embassy scholarship program. And she graduated from, from that university in law and English. But not only did she graduate, she graduated valedictorian for the graduating class of 2019. Her great passion 
is to contribute to achieving a sustainable peace in Afghanistan. And she now works as a peace and reconciliation associate with the United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan, where she contributes to projects promoting peace and conflict resolution in remote provinces of Afghanistan, with a focus on women's inclusion in mediation, conflict resolution, and peace negotiations. Alongside this, she has been working on providing practical legal courses and legal aid clinics focusing on gender equality and promoting women's access to free legal aid services and justice institutions. But she does this every day knowing that she risks her life. And it made me feel that my problems, my concerns around gender equality were nothing in the face of what she experiences. And yet, every one of the 17 women I met proved the theme of collective individualism, each facing conflict and pressures, and yet able to listen to the stories of abuse and harassment, positive experiences and challenge that we face in Scottish politics, and seeing similar themes and struggles. They were not angry, negative, or pessimistic. Rather, they were optimistic. They believe that change will come if we all support each other. The message of solidarity and support that we send to them can help give them the strength to continue fighting for women's rights. So today I'm going to do something that I don't normally do, in that I am going to strike the pose. Because actually I suddenly realise why this matters in a picture. And I hope that all of you will send out your picture this weekend so that we can tweet it around the world and let people like those 17 women know that we were thinking of them today and that we are standing in solidarity with them. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call Christina McKelvey to close for the Scottish Government. Minister, please, till five o'clock. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I mean, how, how do you follow all of those wonderful speeches in this, this chamber today? It's, this place is always at its best when it comes together. Uh, and, and sticks up for something they really believe in. And women's equality is something that this place, for some of the people who have been here for 20 years, has always been, you know, the place to watch and the place to lead. And I'm very pleased to have been leading this debate and hearing all of the contributions today. Because I do also know the journey in women, uh, support of women's rights and empowerment did not begin in Beijing in 1995, and it certainly will not end there. But it was a significant milestone. It showed what could be possible when civil society, grassroots activists and governments work together towards a common cause. And the result, the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, remains one of the principal guiding documents for advancing women's rights and realising equality today. And her contribution to the Chamber, Elaine Smith, said, um, women's equality uh, rights are real and urgent, and I couldn't agree with her more. And I'm incredibly grateful for the contributions, as I said, from across the Chamber. And I want to uh, deal with some of the, the, the key points that, that came up in the debate, because there were many, I've got pages and pages of notes of things that people were interested in. But one of the key elements that came up was that the issues around about violence against women and how we tackle violence against women and how we will not all be equal until we deal with that. And I would hope that the equally safe work we are doing, whether it's in this place, whether it's with COSLA, whether it's equally safe in schools work that we're doing, or whether it's equally safe work we're doing in workplaces and all of the work that we take forward, that we will make that difference. It won't just take legislation to fix this. No matter how proud we are of that domestic abuse bill we passed in this place last year, it will take that cultural change and all of that work, I will hope, will make that difference there. Patrick Harvey, Sarah Boyack, Maurice Corey and a number of others raised uh, the issues around about intersectionality and how incredibly important that is. Whether it's black and ethnic minority women, whether it's women with disabilities, whether it's people across the LGBTI um, communities, we have to ensure that this place reflects that, but all of our work reflects that intersectional approach. We are not a homogenous group, as I think Patrick Harvey said. We are all a, a series of different characteristics and we should all reflect that too. Sandra White gave up an impassioned speech, as she always does, about equal pay. And Sandra White will know as a lowly union, un, unison rep in Glasgow, I was fighting hard against that reform, the um, Workforce Pay and Benefits Review at the time. But to see it come to such a good resolution, but too, too late in the day for some. And there's a really incredible story that I know of a woman that I met. I was at a funeral a few weeks ago of a colleague of mine who was a workforce um, a terms and conditions officer in unison that I worked with and I met a woman there who had got £28,000 back from her equal pay claim. She told me, do you know what it meant for me? 
And I says, tell me. And she says, I was able to walk away from the terrible relationship I was in, where I was abused financially and physically. That was my ticket to freedom. So don't ever underestimate how much just having that financial security can mean to the difference in somebody's life. We've talked a lot today about um, health and, and the issues around about women's health. And I would hope, especially the questions raised about reproductive rights and access uh, to those rights as well, that the Women's Health Plan will be a place where we can all work together uh, in doing that as well. Paula McNeill said uh, when, when she, in her remarks, that until women feel safe, we won't have that equality. And that's just a watchword that I'm just going to put in everywhere I go now. And if I get the opportunity, I'll credit you with you, but I might just steal it and use it myself. But no, you're ab absolutely right. And I have to say a grateful thanks to all of the organisations and individuals who across many years in this place and outside this place and across uh, civic society and our charity sector who have really done their bit for, for gender equality. And we've probably had lots of um, a, a experiences of that. But I also find International Women's Day to be uh, an uplifting day. It comes down to that feeling of solidarity it invokes and the focus that it gives in celebrating women and their achievements. And we've heard about many of them here today. Greta, Malala, people who are known by their first names. Women who are known by their first names. The 17 women that Michelle Ballantyne met. Patrick Harvey, Rona Mackay, Alec Cole Hamill and, and Sarah Boya all mentioned their sheroes. And Rona Mackay and her contribution mentioned a particular one of mine, Catherine Johnson. She mentioned the Me Too movement. She mentioned Martha, Marsha Scott, but she also mentioned, more importantly, those women, those everyday heroes who do their bit every single day. Women and girls who are standing up, speaking out, breaking the mold, flouting the stereotypes, challenging the status quo, and, and embodying that term that they use for us now, those dangerous women. Women and girls who are carers, workers, students, activists, every single one of them incredibly important. The young women I've met in the Parliament Project and the Women's Convention and the Young Women Lead Programme, oh my goodness, is our future in good hands when you spend five minutes with some of those young women. I'm incredibly privileged in my ministerial role because it brings me in contact with so many inspirational people and women from all walks of life and all stages of life. Women who are courageous and passionate about tackling issues that are important to them in their communities, including gender equality, but other issues too. I saw such passion at the Feisty Women Conference in Dundee just this Saturday. I saw such care and compassion and kindness in the Edinburgh Rape Crisis Centre that I visited last week. I saw such activism at the National Advisory Council and Women and Girls Circle event just a few weeks ago. And I saw the generosity of the shared experience from the FGM activists and others who have helped me in my work um, on the FGM bill going forward. And as I said, the Young Women and the Young Women Lead Project. Presiding officer, this Saturday, this place will be a joyful place. Not that it's always, always a joyful place, but this place on Saturday will be filled to the gunnels by women because it will be the Scottish Women's Convention's International Women's Day event in this parliament. And I have to thank the Convention for the work that they've done over 20 odd years as well, especially one of my personal sheroes, Agnes Tolmey. Many in the chamber will know who she is. Women from communities across Scotland fill this chamber and there is so much energy that you can't help but feel hopeful and inspired. I'd like to see more diverse women in this chamber, in, in, in this chamber and at this event too. And that's why that intersectional approach that we've all spoken about today is incredibly important. For me, International Women's Day belongs to all of those women. To Alec Cole Hamilton's great aunt, Joan MBE. What a wonderful, wonderful story. What a sad end. Because what could she have achieved if she had been with us that bit longer? So on Friday, I will be uh, with the South Lanarkshire Cross Party Women's Group Council, Women's Group, hosting an International Women's Day event too. So not just national, but local activism, which incredibly inspires me as well. It is absolutely right that we use International Women's Day to acknowledge where we need to take action towards gender equality and to reaffirm our commitment to taking that action. Joanne Lamont told us about the legacy of the women's movement and the women who have changed the world and how we should draw on those, that, their legacy in order to make the improvements for the future. 
But I'm also clear that we do have to do more to understand, reflect on our policies and strategies and tackle the intersectional discrimination and inequality that women and girls face. I would hope the data and sex work by the Chief Statistician will be welcomed by many in this chamber and especially Elaine Smith who spoke specifically about that. Because we won't have achieved gender equality until all women and girls are equal. 25 years on from Beijing, there is a lot that we can be proud of in Scotland. It's important to celebrate the progress and advances that we have and continue to make. But we must ensure that over the course of the next 25 years, we not only fiercely guard that process, pro progress that's been made and already been made, but we strive to keep on making progress towards gender equality. There was a couple of things that were raised specifically with me in the chamber around about STEM and women in STEM. And I would hope that the gender uh, champions work that's been done for women in STEM would be something that would be really welcomed by the, the members who asked about that. The Deputy Minister's Task Force, I have to say, Rosanna Hussein is a formidable co-chair and will keep him right in every way. But there's quite a few, quite a lot of work being done across that area in STEM. And also in the Women in Agri Task Force, I had the great joy of launching that fund last year at the Royal Highland Show with a group of an amazing uh, women farmers. And I've just been invited along to a dairy farm in my constituency that's it's operated by a young woman and she's got two wee kids as well. How she does it, I don't know. But I'll be really keen to see how the Agri Task Force has supported her in the work that she's doing. Presiding officer, we've had a fantastic debate today. This year's theme was called Each for Equal, and we should all be doing our equal photographs and sending that solidarity out. It reminds us absolutely clearly that we all have our part to play. And can I finish with Malala, who says we cannot all succeed when half of us are held back. I wholeheartedly agree, and I look forward to working with everyone across the chamber to advance the work to make sure that each for equal becomes a reality. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our debate on celebrating International Women's Day. The next item is consideration of business motion 21100 in the name of Graeme Day on behalf of the Bureau, setting out revisions to this week's business. Could I call on Graeme Day to move this motion? Move, presiding officer. Thanks very much. And no member has indicated the wish to speak of the motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 21100 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Now, there's only one question uh, this afternoon. The question is that motion 21073, in the name of Christina McKelvey, on celebrating International Women's Day 2020, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move on shortly to members' business in the name of Miles Briggs on improving diagnosis of preeclampsia. But we'll just have a short pause, not a suspension, just a short pause while members and ministers change seats. <laughs>